right, so let's move on to our next speaker, and that's Wayne Parker, uh, Skyshed and Beyond. Over to you, Wayne. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much for having me. Happy birthday to you guys, I guess, in a couple of weeks then, uh, club or, or uh, society, uh, whichever it is. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And the RESC, especially the Toronto Centre, is very near and dear to our hearts. Um, I, as they used to say, courted my wife uh, by going to the planetarium and uh, seeing the guest speakers on a monthly basis. Uh, in fact, until we, we moved away to darker skies, we moved to, to southwestern Ontario uh, in the early 90s, and we missed it. We still do. And we missed the planetarium, too, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> um, so it's always a pleasure to have any dealings with the RESC. And of course, we deal with uh, members of the Toronto Centre and members of the RESC right across Canada, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis uh, because of the fact that we've been very fortunate uh, that astronomers and, and Canadian astronomers have uh, adopted our solutions uh, over the last 20 years. And uh, I'm very, I guess, proud and, and happy to say that it's hard to figure numbers exactly, but uh, we got to be over 10,000 of our designs, our reservatory designs around the world now in almost 20 years. And it has to be just based on sales of plans, the sales of our pods and our pod maxes. And not nearly that number of, of, of our uh, telescope peers. Um, we sell an awful lot of peers and, and it's, it's a really enjoyable part of what we do. Of course, for those of you who may not be familiar when I say peer, in different parts of the world are known as pedestals. Um, in our case, it's a steel pole that, uh, that supports the, the, the telescope and or mount. Um, and it lets you get a tripod out of the way. So it's for a permanent installation or certainly semi-permanent at least. Um, and it all, all this started uh, really in the, uh, it, by the mid nineties, I was really tired after 25 years and a lot of you will really understand this, uh, uh, tearing my stuff down, setting my stuff up, uh, you know, hoping that Friday night would be clear and then spending three hours setting up. Uh, and as more gear came along, and this was, you know, by the 80s, in the mid 80s and stuff, uh, and uh, inevitably, of course, the, the clouds would roll in. I'd be running the weather radio the whole time, you know, uh, outside listening for, I'd hear encroaching, you know, the clouds were coming and that's about the best we had in those days. I got really tired of doing that. Uh, like most astronomers do, uh, maybe some enjoy it, seeing it as a form of, uh, exercise or something. But, um, for me, I knew that if I was going to really be able to pursue, uh, the real passion I had for astronomy and getting deeper into it, uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd need a more permanent structure, something to put my, uh, my telescope in and leave it in and have instant access, you might say. And at the time on the internet, now, by the time I started really considering this, it was now, let's say the early 90s, mid 90s, the internet was fledgling and I would search and search and there was really nothing. Uh, there was three or four, maybe five, six uh, websites you could see that people had built their own uh, geodesic dome or a roll off to some degree or something or fabricated a classic style dome out of, uh, I don't know, materials, you know, uh, masonite. That was a good one. <laughs> so anyway, sorry, it just sounds funny. I'm going to make a dome out of masonite and put all my expensive equipment inside. We'll see what happens when it rains. So, uh, I, you know, I was really frustrated that when I looked at commercial uh, solutions, they were there was none Canadian at the time that I found it was anywhere near in the consumer realm, you might say. They were mostly American. And then if you went offshore to Europe uh, uh, or Australia, where they there were existing observatory makers, they were all fiberglass. They were very expensive. And when I looked around and talked to fellow club members, and because I've gone to Starfest for decades, since the beginning, basically, in the time, there used to be one called Geronia at the same time. Uh, which was another great one. Um, I talked to a lot of people, you know, I talked to Terry Dickinson, he would be the guest speaker, he'd be speaking about Mars, you know, on, and, and I'd say, observatories, you know, what do you do, you know, and, and he invited me to visit his, and uh, I did one dark, uh, uh, stormy, or sort of 
fall night. And the first thing I noticed is it only opened about three feet. It was a roll off. It was stuck. It was old. And it used a classic design, which is a caster and rollers, uh, uh, angle iron, I should say, and casters, which is very unforgiving as far as tolerance because your two Vs are meshing. And, uh, and I noticed that people would, would, would concrete their, their support roll-offs into the ground, and which gave you no adjustability if you're in any kind of m moving soil, frost, et cetera. Uh, so, so I, you know, considered these things, uh, and uh, I thought, you know, if I'm going to build one for myself, maybe I could do it in such a way that others could replicate what I've done and uh, do it all over the world, you know, try and standardize uh, the parts, um, speak to every professional carpenters, concrete makers, steel makers, anything I could think of. If someone ever offers me a tour of their factory, certainly not these days, I take it. To me, that's like going to the zoo. You know, wow, all these machines that make things and do things. And mm, what, can I, what can I do with that? You know, so uh, I got that idea. And I, 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 the funny thing is we moved away from the city um, to, to uh, west, southwestern Ontario for dark skies. And um, I started seeing these, uh, well, I, I saw two things. I saw these sheds that a family uh, in regionally was known like a family business where they had, uh, uh, had made these for years. And I thought, oh, I remembered back to when I was a kid in the 60s. And I, this article stuck in my head about a UCLA, I believe it was UCLA, a professor who was allowed to uh, build um, uh, uh, an, a roll off in, in Joshua tree. And all I remember is it looked like a, a, a log cabin, you know, it wasn't much to it. And I kept seeing these, these picturesque little cabin, like gingerbread house sheds around the area I moved to out in the country. And I tracked down the, the, the people who made them. I said, you know, if you took that, I actually made them a graphic and animation, took a picture of one, said, if you took this and moved this roof and we made outrigger supports, this would be what's called a roll-off observatory. Well, not to belabor the point, we started making them, and now there's, there's I don't know, thousands. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And we may get to make a lot of peers, and we get to see all the pictures, and people send us thousands of pictures, and how happy they are. And one of the things that I, I approach design from, one of the big uh, uh, areas I approach design from is functionality. Well, quality first, but functionality, longevity. And low maintenance, uh, I think if you put those things together and uh, uh, time has, has proven um, the test, um, um, I'm sitting next to my uh, Skyship roll off, it's almost 20 years old, I can push a button or roll it off with, uh, with one hand with minimal maintenance each year. I'm speaking to you from, uh, as you see in the larger image now, uh, Pod Max, um, which is our larger, uh, because we went from sheds the problem with the sheds was we couldn't ship them. We couldn't ship them all over the world. It was very expensive. And I knew that if we were successful with the sheds, we'd want to go to uh, our domes. And that's when we came out with pod. And of course, the, uh, the CAO has our uh, cars, I like to call it, has, uh, has uh, six, I believe, there and a, and a sky shed. We're very honored by that. Uh, it shows you like our stuff. And, and actually, as I'm speaking, I want to show you a few things. So, you know, I don't want to spend my whole time talking about our history and all that. If you know of us, um, I, I say, you know, certainly if you're a Canadian astronomer, you either know of us, uh, either own one of our solutions or, uh, or, or um, I know somebody does, you know. And uh, we work very hard to, uh, to support uh, our, our customers and our, as I hate to think of them as just customers because they're long-term relationships. Uh, some of our customers uh, we've known for 20 years now and seen the incredible things they've done. And others, we've seen the move from setting up to a more permanent solution so that you get serious. And now, I mean, I'm going to use Ron Breacher as an example. Ron Breacher out of Guelph has become quite well known. Um, he needed a place to be able to set up and do his thing. And he made the most of it and he's done fantastically. And he's, and there's many, there's dozens of sort of Rons around the world uh, that we know of that have just gone on to do sort of amazing things. And that, that really, then I look back and say, well, that's what we were trying to achieve. We're trying to, by making low cost observatories instead of those expensive fiberglass ones that I looked up in the, in the nineties, 
um, by making them affordable and, and making them quality and, and that they last. And some of our pods, for instance, are on their even sixth owners, which is pretty crazy. It's not good for business. Come on, folks, buy a new one. I mean, I'm kidding. And we support them. Like just today, I, I, uh, we work seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day supporting the thousands of astronomers. And I personally speak to everybody all the time because I love it. It's fellow astronomers. Say, send me your shots from last night. And they say, well, send me yours. And here's a few, by the way, that's Pod Max I'm sitting in now uh, out, in the, uh, uh, out in the country here. Uh, it's not open like that right now. It's a little chilly. You can probably see my breath. It's about one degree in here. Um, but these are just a few. And, and I just want to touch on before, because I know I don't want to go way over time here. But we're very thankful. We're very busy. It's, I don't want to say I feel guilty in these terrible times. But people are taken to the sanctuary of, let's say, their backyard. Or We like, and we've always liked, that we want to be all-inclusive. We've always tried to support and attract um, women and girls uh, to, to astronomy and to, to, our, to our products because we hope it'll encourage them to do that, um, and all ages uh, as well. Uh, and, and we're seeing that. And in fact, uh, if, you, if you go to Facebook, uh, if you're on Facebook, um, we have Skyship Observatories, just search that, or, or me, Wayne Parker, and we daily share uh, pod and shed and pod max owner images. And some of them are just, they're getting more incredible all the time. And, um, uh, I just, uh, the next thing I want to touch on is, is the fact that it's finally coming to fruition. I'm just going to flip through a few of these. What I, what I hoped would happen, uh, 15 years ago is sort of coming to fruition. And that is film went the way of the dodo cameras got better. Scopes got smaller and, uh, there's nothing wrong with a big scope. I'm sitting with a 14-inch scope behind me, which is sort of the beginning of the big scope, you might say, and I love it. By the way, thank you, Skywatcher. Thank you, Celestron. Thank you, Starazona, because I'm about to put a Hyperstar on, and all my friends with Hyperstars who are doing amazing things keep telling me it's going to blow your mind. But blizzards to start any time, so I'm putting everything together, and over the winter, I'll watch YouTube videos and read books and do things, and then come out here hopefully mid-March, uh, when it's above freezing again and a little easier to work. And, uh, uh, and that's the thing. We, our, we build our, our products to work, you know, year round. There are pods in Siberia. There are pods. And in fact, let me, uh, uh, let me just uh, open up here. I'm going to, uh, to show you. Uh, and I'm just going to put a slideshow on. But why don't I do that while I'm uh, uh, speaking so you can see a few. Um, these are, this will work. Um, sorry, I just want to use a different program. Sorry about that. Um, and I want to make sure I haven't got, already got a, uh, a slideshow running so I don't screw it up on you guys here. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Open with. I'll do it with. Uh, there we go. And then I'll open that. And now I just need to hold tab to see my Zoom. There we go. Whoops. Well, I was almost there. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> let me try that again. Sorry about that. Ah, uh, there we go. It's running. It was just me uh, there. I should be good. I can close that. I should be able to. I don't know why this worked earlier and it's not working now. So I'm sorry about that. Um, let's see, there we go. Ah, I think I got it. So uh, just as I'm speaking, these are pods from around the world. That's Australia. That's a 20 inch pl plane wave. That is madness. Um, oh, I forget who sent us this a drone shot of his uh, XL5. So they're, they're all over. Uh, I believe that is in Finland or somewhere. It could be Alaska. I don't know. We ship them everywhere. There's thousands of these things. They're coming out of the woodwork. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. But it's, it's, really a, it's really a lot of fun. Can you imagine? I spend my day each day uh, helping you know, push the, uh, the ball up the hill, as I say, to, to, to build these things and ship them all over the world. But I spend most of my day speaking with uh, and emailing with and chatting with the fellow astronomers. And we're very active astronomers ourselves. And again, uh, I, I want to touch on the fact that how happy I am with the smaller cameras and CMOS. Loving the CMOS, loving the live stacking um, because we spend so much time helping our fellow astronomers. We have to sort of sneak out to the observatory. So when I see it's clear, I work overtime to, to get out that night or those nights and uh, 
push the ball forward with uh, uh, learning, you know, and, uh, and this year was a big switchover. I wanted to really get into live stacking with CMOS uh, and, and getting a really a faster F ratio so I could get, uh, uh, so I could do things faster. And I'm so happy. I'm so blown away um, uh, using, I'm, same as the ZWO, I'm using an Altair 294 color uh, TC with the, uh, with the 14 inch edge. Uh, with their 0.7 times reducer and a uh, the new very happy with the Skywatcher EQ8 RH. That's two thousand bucks extra for the RH. So you say it every time you tell a friend that you own that mount. Oh, that's an RH. You know that's not an R. Uh, that's two thousand bucks more. What it does, I have no idea. But it's two thousand bucks more, so it's got to be better. Um, so as I said, the uh, we always have more we're working on. Uh, there's always uh, things up our sleeve for the future, things that we might not be able to discuss at this time. But um, we're always aware of and getting feedback uh, from from our owners, and so we like to react to that. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, really, really exciting things. And uh, oh, that's a strange one you're seeing there now. <laughs> The, the gentleman built a platform, and now it's too bad I can't go back to that because it's a slideshow. Built a platform and did that, and I said, would you please put some supports under the base? Uh, because we did build them so that you could put hundreds of pounds in them, but they'd have to be supported uh, on the edges, you know. So our websites, our Facebook our websites are skyshed.com, skyshedpod.com, skyshedpodmax.com. Oh, my God, it goes on forever. We are amalgamating them uh, into the new year. We're working on that now. Uh, and again, Facebook, we Instagram and Twitter on that, some, not as much. Uh, our demographic seems to skew to uh, Facebooking, which is just fine with us because it's a lot of fun. And it's a great place to, you know, comment and, and, and be part of a community. So uh, thank you very much for your support. Don't forget, one of the best things about, for those of you who are in the Toronto Centre who, who live in Southern Ontario, you've got an observatory factory up in Owen Sound that you can actually hook the trailer on your car or your SUV and drive up there and pick one up and put in your backyard uh, like this guy here in the picture is doing, uh, building a deck. Oh, what a nice job he did. And probably did it in three hours. Look at that. Um, a riser, as I like to call him. I think of his deck as a thing in the background there with railings and stairs and stuff. So, And, and, and by the way, pods uh, do go on from the grass, gravel, uh, uh, decks, uh, uh, concrete pads, of course. Um, so we design them to even what they go on. People have them on roofs. Uh, I don't know, all over the place. Uh, it's great. And uh, so I just want to say, oh, and one last thing I'd, I'd like to say too, another exciting thing about this is, can you imagine as a boyhood astronomer growing up? And one of the nice parts about this is, uh, is not only with the great people and the fascinating people, I swear every single person I do with every day should write a book because they're amazing, incredible people with incredible backgrounds. There's something about astronomers and people who are drawn to it. Many are musicians um, and many are ham radio operators. Some have the triumvirate uh, and, and, and not a small percentage. Uh, it's a strange it's a type of brain, I guess. Uh, I like those things. So can you imagine uh, the interesting conversations we get to have all day uh, with. But besides that, I mean, we got a call from, well, I'm not under an NDA for, for this one right now, so I can say I got a call from SETI last week uh, working on a prototypical uh, situation and could use our help and uh, dealing with Lockheed right now. And there's even some others that we've dealt with NASA for years on and off as needed. Um, and, and there's some others that were under uh, non-disclosures, unfortunately which really sucks, I gotta tell you. Because you know, you wanna tell the world, but you can't. So uh, I just hope you you enjoy our stuff and, and it, you know, call me, it's on the website, uh, email me, do whatever, you know, Facebook and say, hey Wayne, I've got a nine and a quarter on a CGX and I wanna use it more. Well, I'm here for you. Paul? All right, thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, Appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to us and lots of uh, neat uh, setups. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, do we have any questions from the online community? Yes, we do. So Wayne, Leo to uh, CAF asks, uh, 
uh, what what are the pros and cons to a steel versus a concrete pier? Ah, those are good questions. Um, you know, there's basically four materials generally used for piers uh, from wood, believe it or not. Some people will bolt like four four by fours together and put it down on the ground and there you go. That's not going to be a long-term one, but it'll work. Um, aluminum, of course, if you look at pier techs, uh, uh, a rising column, I forget what you call them, lifting columns, uh, aluminum, uh, concrete, of course, and, and steel. Um, I'd say of the, yeah, I'd have to say of the four of them, concrete's my least favorite. Um, number one, you are erecting a monument to your endeavors, uh, should you decide to move on. Uh, somebody's gonna have to come up with a big sledgehanger and take that sucker out. Um, if you're gonna go far above the, uh, the, 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 the level, the, the, the soil, um, you're going to have to rebar it up and down. So it starts to get pretty complicated with uh, building pretty massive. Generally, they're minimum 12 inches in diameter. Um, and uh, uh, again, if you're going to come up some distance, uh, you know, you, they get more complicated. But 12 inches is kind of obtrusive in, in, in especially in a small uh, observatory. It's a knee cracker, that kind of thing. Um, another thing about concrete we found, and this is just through, you know, we deal with so many hundreds you know thousands of astronomers that you start to without keeping data points you start to you know get trends and stuff and um one thing that's interesting is think about your tripod it's made of well, i don't know what aluminum pressed steel i don't know whatever parts wood you know they used to use why good dampener and especially if you go back to the 90s and stuff when or even 80s and we had the uh, let's say the meads and celestrons with plastic gears and stuff and they were like, <laughs> they were like clockwork mechanisms. You can look through the eyepiece and go click, click. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And the thing is that got worse if you put it on a concrete pier because there was no dissipation of that uh, vibration down through your tripod, through your, uh, you know, through, through, through blow. So it was all like neck up vibration and, and, and it would be, you know, you go from a tripod thing, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be so stable. I'm going to put a pier in it. You put a concrete pier in it, you stick your, <laughs> you look at the eyepieces going, dick, dick. <laughs> this was not a good idea. So I was never a big fan of, of concrete. I like steel because, yes, you put in a concrete footing, but you can bring it up to ground level or just above and then go from there and steel. Let's say you move in three years, unbolt, carry away, not too difficult for, you know, put a planter pot, the next donor on it. There you go, forgotten. Um, uh, and of course, the, the best thing is when I designed our pier, I looked around and what I really saw the big problem was, and I came to the Toronto Center uh, and said, okay, is there a little Merlin guy or something uh, or wizard? Because I've looked and looked and spoke to people and looked around and I can't get any answers about putting in a pier. I thought, is there some little sort of character who travels around from club to club and says, ah, you need a hole in the ground, you know? It was really bizarre, and uh, so I just started figuring it out, speaking to people and concrete guys and metal guys and stuff. And and the biggest problem I saw was if you have a concrete pier and you've got, let's say, bolts sticking out of the top of it or something to attach your 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 your, your scope or your mount. When you pour that concrete, you've got to usually you'll run sight lines and stuff to Polaris because. You've only got a few degrees, whatever that latitude adjustment is in your mount or in your wedge or in your scope that, uh, uh, that, that you can adjust to, 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 po to polar. And, and if you're not, well, just knock that concrete column down and build a new one uh, or adapt. But with steel, you see, what I did was, aha, I came along and I said, how come everybody, when they make steel piers, they put a plate at the bottom, they put a plate at the top, and they put a pole in the middle, and then they put slots and square big square plates on the bottom and they give you, ah, that's how they get their five degrees of rotation. But that's stupid because again, you have to get your bolts within five degrees of, you know, or within, let's say it's got five and your mount's got five. So 10 degrees of, of, of polar alignment, not good. Um, so what I did was I chopped the damn top of it off, welded a collar underneath and then I said, well, wait a minute, let's say the, uh, the, 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 the CAO, has, uh, or car again, as I like to call it, has a bunch of uh, piers or uh, mounts in the observatory. Um, if I separated the two top 
uh, plates, then you could just take the top one away and put another one on and put a new mount on. You didn't have to, because again, the piers used to be designed for that mount, for that telescope. Everything was custom. Anyway, so the point is, it gave us a few things. Now we could take the cap off and, uh, uh, and we could spin it around 360 degrees. And I put Frankenstein, I call them neck bolts, horizontal bolts around it. We torque it on no loss of stability at all uh, from, from uh, having it not all one welded piece as proven by the amazing thousands of uh, uh, astro uh, photographs taken on the mounts. But um, not only that, uh, you see, we get, we get rough leveling of the, of the pier at the bottom. And the top, because I separated those two top plates, you can, you level them, you put a bubble level on top and you level them down. And what happens is we make piers for, for owners. And then two years later, they call me and say, when I got a, when I bought the pier, I had a uh, C gem and now I'm going to uh, G11. You know, what can I do? Well, maybe that, in fact, what we've done with our friends at Altair Astro, who make our version of the pier for Europe, um, because they have a store and lots of mounts in it, and a fabrication stop down the down the road, they have developed between us. We've developed adapters for an awful lot of mounts and scopes. But they they figured out a way to put a whole bunch into one, so that our multi adapter, what we call our Altair multi adapter, that combined with the plate we're putting on supports about twenty mounts. So you have the flexibility of saying, oh, I'd like to get a an MX plus. Bingo, take this off, bolt that on, you're off to the races, that sort of thing. So, so you know, the short answer is um, we can pull our line anything, anytime we want. We can, we got super amount of leveling. We can toss away an adapter plate and put on another. Vibration dissipates down the structure. Um, now we have much, much less vibration in our equipment, so it's not as big a deal. Um, you can, because the top of the cap comes off, you can fill, you can dump in sand, make it rock solid. It doesn't really need it. It only lessens oscillation duration or ring time. Uh, and of course, the other thing is you can drive out here to Stratford and pick one up. So there's your answer. Okay, very good. Thanks for all that detail. Um, Cicely asks, uh, why don't you use your pod in the winter? And then asked a follow up. Um, what are what are major winter weather considerations? Yes, good question. Um, we can, and we designed them. In fact, pod uh, the pod I'm sitting in, the, the smaller pod, the eight foot pod next to it, especially, are designed. The materials will work down to minus sixty. Um, of course, most of your astronomical gear, your computer, your laptop, if you're doing visual. You better height, you know, heat the eyepiece. You're going to fog it up. Um, most of that, you know, minus 20 starts getting to be uh, uh, pretty tough on a lot of those things. Um, and out here, we can go for months. Uh, I always say the first five years you get an observatory, you go out every winter. And after about the sixth one, you go, eh, you know, if I go out as long as I can into December and then I board it up and, and come out again in mid-March and, and retool in the winter, you know, tweak my gear, learn some stuff, read some books, watch some videos, and come out. And by that time, you know, you're chomping at the bit. You've got a, a bucket load of new gear and new new ideas, and you get at it again. So, But we do design them, and there are those uh, who go out at, at minus 30 and do this. Uh, and the other thing for me is we are a few uh, dozens of yards away from our observatories, and we're 20 miles away from, from Lake Huron. And we can get blizzards that go basically from – Christmas to March and uh, digging your way here is not fun. So I use this time to sort of regroup, but we do, we do, we do design them uh, to be used year round. And your equipment to be left in year round too. Very good. Uh, a quick question for me. Um, I, I've been in many of the, I'm not sure what to call it, the, the regular or classic pod, uh, uh, pod, pod uh, sky, sky shed pod. Um, and that that's about two meters maybe in diameter. What's the difference with the max? How much bigger? How much taller uh, is the max? Good, good, good question. Uh, when we when we designed a pod, uh, the eight foot, I'd like to have designed a nine actually, make it a little bigger, a little taller. And it was all about shipping and shipping it around the world. And we sort of broke the 
the, the straw that break, broke the camel's back. Uh, if we went to nine and we had to go a little smaller, we wanted, but for most people, it, it works well. Um, when we were moving up to the larger one, uh, I considered 10 feet and I thought, well, it costs hundreds of thousands. It costs, you know, half a million dollars to develop one of these. And uh, it's my wife and I were a mom, pa, a couple of astronomers who love doing this, you know, um, more time to mortgage the house. Wayne's got an idea. And uh, uh, so uh, I decided, you know what? We don't want to go a foot in radius, you know, for half a million bucks. Let's go two feet, you know, and a bit. So we made it 12 and a half. And then by the time we had the pod bays, you will see behind me here uh, with an, appropriately an Apollo in there. Um, it gets up to about 18 feet uh, with a, a full complement of the uh, of the base. Thanks for asking. Um, our, yeah, our first question. question. Go, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Sorry to jump in. Hey, Wayne, um, you're still manufacturing these in Ontario and Canada. So um, what has stopped you from um, manufacturing in Asia? Oh, oh, no, I would never consider it. Um, it's very important to us. Uh, like I said, when we developed this, there really weren't any Canadian observatory companies. And a few have tried over the years, but it really takes a lot, a lot of dedication. It really does to, to our, you know, to, to our fellow astronomers to make it work. And it was important to us that we employed our neighbors. So most of the, 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 the suppliers we have, other than the, the box suppliers and that kind of stuff, they're, they're basically mom pods. They're out here in the country and their family uh, uh, suppliers, hardware suppliers, uh, tooling suppliers, incredible, incredible people. And the only reason that we've had any success whatsoever, uh, the two reasons, of course, are the great support from fellow astronomers and the incredible support from all these local family-owned businesses here in throughout Ontario uh, that have supported us by, by, by working with us to develop and uh, supplying us. And, and not to mention these times of uh, uh, these terrible COVID times, um, I can't believe the, the factory in Owen Sound that, that produces pods is, is, uh, is open and running at full speed because they are to some degree essentially make agricultural uh, products and especially in the spring and summer they were they were forced to close like everywhere else and then came back um, but they've managed to get dozens and dozens of, uh, of pods out for us and we have dozens more uh, shipping in the next couple of weeks again before Christmas an early Christmas present for some you might say but that's only because of the incredibly hard work under incredibly difficult circumstances by all the great people local people basically uh, uh, what we consider local uh, on a world scale uh, that, 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 that help us do all this. Thank you. Wayne, let me ask you one more question from our uh, YouTube chat. And sure. it is one that I encountered when I was helping uh, set up the Skyshed pods uh, at the Carr Astronomical Observatory. Yes. What do you recommend for the base? Patio mm -hmm. stones or a wood deck? I prefer um, at the minimum crushed gravel or something. I mean, you can temporarily for a year so you can stick it on your lawn. But imagine we're trying to get the top of that wall level and you've got it on all kinds of bumps and things and stuff. So that's not great. It doesn't have to be totally level. It's very forgiving. We always build a lot of forgiveness, uh, tolerance into our and forgiveness into our, uh, into our designs. But I prefer a wood deck. Uh, I know people say, oh, well, uh, critters can get through. Well, what you do is you just staple down window screening before you, you uh, screw down your, your decking. Uh, and that allows ventilation because we like ventilation. Imagine it's open at night. And if you're in a very dewy place, as, as dry as we can kind of keep, try and keep it, moisture is going to build up. So we can't, we can't hermetically seal it because then the problem is going to be, you know, moss growing on your optics. So we need ventilation. And I like a, a deck because it ventilates. Uh, there's a gap between the, the dome and the wall that's overlapped, of course. Uh, and we even cover that up with foam in the, in the winter when blizzards are coming in, high velocity blizzards. But I like that cyclic uh, ventilation from cool air under the deck up through the observatory during the day. Uh, the problem is a lot of, not the problem, but a lot of people choose to go on, on concrete, uh, which generally you know, starts to get a lot more laborious you have to put conduit and stuff in, and so it's more expensive and things. You don't have access to below, let's say. Um, 
you have less problem with vermin eating your wires and stuff underneath. We run conduit uh, so they don't. But um, uh, certainly a deck. And, and, and when people do build concrete, especially with like the pod max I'm in, we make sure we, we call it a pitcher's mound that they pour with a chamfer uh, all around because imagine places like Florida and they're putting these things in torrential rains. Well, what happens is if you pour concrete very often, you let it cure, it'll bowl. And uh, uh, so therefore all the water is running towards the observatory. So we get them to do the opposite. So it kind of goes lawn, gravel, uh, deck, and, and or toss up, which your favorite for. Oh, another thing about concrete, it tends to heat up during the day and reflect uh, light towards the observatory. So again, a deck for me, a riser as I like to call it, is, is the perfect thing. Okay, good. I built uh, both concrete bases or patio stone paver uh, bases and a wood deck with screening. Um, so I, I've seen both in action, but th thanks for all that advice. Cool. Thank, thanks for your time. Um, uh, I think we have to move on. So uh, thank uh, you very much. It. Thank you very much. It's great fun. Thank you.